of whom we have much to say and hard to explain since you have become dull parents. For though by this time you want to be teachers, you need some of the teacher who have the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not salt. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not skilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are full age, as those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Therefore, leading the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift, that they become partakers of the faith, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God, and put him to an open shame. For the earth which shrinks from the rain that often comes upon it, and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated, receives blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. But, beloved, we are confident of better things than sinning. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until you end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. One of the real themes tonight in this uh, section from 511 through 612 is the idea of being warned. The idea of, of a warning. And it's so important in life to know how, how to handle warnings. Do we listen to warnings? That's first thought. Can we listen to them? I want to show you an event that happened in uh, uh, history. That's the, uh, that's the Challenger space shuttle blowing up. January 28th, 1986. Seven astronauts died. Billions of dollars, many years of labor, in a moment blown up and lost. In a moment. Why is there failure? Why? You might, and, and so with that a disaster, what had happened was there were two rings on those booster rockets. You know those booster rockets that were lifting the shuttle? Because the shuttle can't take off by its own power. They need the booster rockets. So there, there was a ring on each of these rockets, and uh, the ring failed. So the space between the fuel and, and the ignition kind of merged into a bomb. And it blew up. Like both of the rockets blew up. There was an O-ring that failed. And this is my point about Hebrews 6 and what Hebrews 6 is talking about. Hebrews 6 is talking about a very extreme case. A very extreme situation where, uh, uh, with the things that are warned about here. But what happened with the Spatial Challenger is even the day before and in the weeks before, an engineer was warning, do not launch this shuttle. Do not launch it. You cannot launch it on January 28th. It's too cold. Those rings will fail. That is, the weather wasn't right. Do not do it. And he was warning again and again, and he was ignored. His supervisor overrode him, signed off because NASA wanted to launch the 25th mission. Right? 25. And so the engineer's voice is ignored and it all blows up. Here's the thing we got to know. Failure comes to a Christian individual, to a Christian family, to a Christian church, where they do not listen to the warnings of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit says, today, if you will hear my voice, harden not your heart. And there are warnings that the Spirit of God gives us. And so you think of the shuttle so beautiful lifting off. You think of a Christian family, such a beautiful family, such a nice home, father and mother, but boom, some disaster happens. And the family divorces, the kids become a mess, and all these things happen. How did that Christian family blow up? It all looks so good from the outside. And so pay attention to the warnings. If you want to avoid disaster, listen to the warnings. That's what I'm talking about. And so it's the lack of taking heed to warnings that causes so many of God's people to fail. So this is a serious chapter. You know, that Challenger thing, like the nation watched it. I can remember I was in college. What a, what a, uh, uh, what a knife to the heart of the country that the, the, uh, how people were sad and demoralized and the nation just kind of sunk. It happens in churches when Christian individuals, families, leaders, pastors, teachers, elders fail. So let's take heed. Pray for one another, 
help each other with that voice of the Holy Spirit speaking through us to each other in love and encouragement and, and encouragement. So even though it's a small warning, it matters. All warnings matter. So ha- ha- having said that, we got to ask ourselves, what is this chapter talking about? I mean, this, this section. The basic flow is going to be, it's going to be talking about the theme of spiritual immaturity, then spiritual failure and judgment. That's what it's talking about, basically speaking. And so you might want to say judgment is a hard thing for God's people to think about. And that's why I think it's kind of hard to, to deal with this chapter because he's talking about uh, people, if they fail, if they fall away, we do them again repentance. It says in verse 7, if the earth gives forth um, herbs, it's useful, it's blessed. But verse 8, if it bears thorns and briars, is rejected in night of being cursed, whose end is to be burned. Judgment's a hard thing to handle. It's just a hard thing to process. Why is that? I just want to talk for a few minutes about judgment, and then we're going to get some outlines up about the chapter. Why is judgment such a hard thing for Christians to handle? First, we don't understand it. Second, We're not well taught about what it means. Third, we're afraid of it. We're afraid of judgment because if we may have a wrong view of God or we have disobedience in our own life. And fourth, we don't like talking about judgment because we don't accept there can be consequences for wrong behavior. It's just a hard, hard thing. But why is it good to talk about judgment and and to see what the Bible says about it? Because Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Fearing the Lord is foundational. You cannot skip that in your foundation, fearing him. People think they can ignore warnings and not face punishment. They can get away with things. This is encouraged today by politicians, district attorneys, and judges who refuse to punish bad behavior. And sometimes... People, if they're caught in sin, think they can simply say, I'm sorry, but there's no real brokenness and heartfelt repentance. Uh, Talk can be cheap. John the Baptist says in Luke 3, 7 through 9, bring forth fruits, therefore meet for repentance. He says, bring forth fruits. And so to come to a, a topic like this, I would say, we need the Holy Spirit. We need the Spirit of God. Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. I am a stranger in, in the earth. Hide not thy commandments from me. There's a difference between reading words and knowing their meaning. And sometimes God's people have a preset pair of glasses, like a theology, and they put it on and they can only see through their glasses. They don't allow the Spirit of God to open their eyes, you might say. It, it's only one, one pair of glasses. So we need to allow God's Holy Spirit to teach us. We need revelation more than just information. We really need revelation. We can know what the text says, but only the Spirit of God can show us fully what it means. The Spirit of God. But sometimes the Spirit of God will show us fully enough so we change our behavior. And may, it will take another age to see what these things fully like fully mean. And sometimes Christians think they can put everything about God in a box. They can put all theology in a box and they have it locked down. But you can't put God in a box. God is so powerful. He is so able to show himself in ways that are powerful. And this is a serious chapter. And he's showing us some. Very serious about who he is and what he's warning us about. So let's go ahead and see what there's uh, titles and outlines from this chapter. 5, 11 to 14, we ought to be teachers. 6, 1 to 3, we ought to go on to perfection. 4 to 9, we ought to be persuaded of better things. And 10 to 12, we ought to hope to the end. So 11 to 14, be grown up seeking for solid food. 1 to 3, move forward to mature teaching. 4 to 6, avoid nailing Christ by turning back. 7 to 8, producer of good crop and thorn. 9 to 12, good words will be remembered and rewarded. My title is uh, God's Ideal for Us Growth and Maturity. And 5, 11 to 14, stunted growth. 6, 1 to 3, true growth, leaving behind the elementary principles. 6, 4 to 8, uh, twisted and irredeemable growth or worthless. And then 6, 9 to 12, um, diligence, patience, and faith, the key to growth. Growth is her theme. I love it. And that is the theme of Hebrews. Growth and growth. 
stunted growth was, was those first three uh, verses. So let's go ahead and do the full screen on that out, out, outline there. Calling us to full maturity, verse one. That's my title because he says, let us go on to perfection. Have you ever had someone call you? God is calling to us to, to come to full maturity. As he calls us, he's going to give us a truthful evaluation. When God calls to us, he doesn't flatter us. He doesn't ignore things because God is relentless for quality. He wants quality. So he has to tell you us where we are on the growth spectrum, a truthful evaluation. Moving forward, after he evaluates us and he, and he recognizes the stunted growth, he says, let us go on. Let us go on to perfection. We need to be moving forward to full maturity. When God calls you to move forward, you have to understand something. There's consequences of not moving forward. The Christian life is not meant to be static. You don't stop. You're either backwards or forwards, however incremental. However, you know, no one, I, I, we can't see each other and know it. I'm saying we know each other and we kind of, we're not God for each other. But what life is, life is always moving forward or, or you may fall away from it. And there's a tragic failure there. Future expectation. Because once you get past the tragic failure, he says, look, we're convinced of better things for you. So here's the thing. Verses 4 through 8 was, was what most people struggle with. And we don't want to spend our whole Bible study there. Because it's in a context. And you have to know what the flow of the chapter is saying. What God is doing is he's giving a most extreme warning. Not many people are ever going to touch that warning. But you just have to know it anyway. You have to know the warning anyway, because it's part of the whole program. Sometimes some Christians camp so much on failure, they forget the better things which are coming for us. So you have to emphasize what God emphasizes and, and have maturity and uh, seriousness. But we are going on to perfection. That's the emphasis here I'm saying. The emphasis is not, woe is me, I'm such a bad person, blah, blah, blah. No, the, the, the emphasis is, Christ is perfect and he's bringing me to perfection, but there are things we have to choose, which is to respond to that call. That's the general gist of, of what, what it's talking about in Light of the Flow. But let's, let's start with this, looking in ver, um, chapter 5, 11 through 14. So he says here, remember in chapter 5, he's talking about Melchizedek as the type of Christ. And Jesus Christ has the has a high priesthood after the order of, of Melchizedek. And that's 1 through 10. And so, like, verse 10, 5, 10 says, called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. So this is incredible stuff. It's kind of like if I opened up my atomic physics book to all of you tonight and said, you see these formulas? If you just did this and this and this and this, you could do this. You know, it just kind of, you're showing it. But then it's like, oh, wait, this is a nursery. This is a nursery. I'm, I, I'm, I'm not in my PhD level atomic physics class. I'm a nursery. So that's what he has to, he has to stop and kind of say that to the uh, believers. And so he says there in verse 11, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. So that's the evaluation, dull of hearing. And so they become sluggish. Now, why did they become sluggish? Why did this happen? And these were believers, genuine born again Christians from a Jewish background, or maybe Gentile proselytes, Gentile converts to Judaism, and, and they had been saved, but then they, you know what they did? They started thinking, you know, this Judaism's not that bad. It's actually pretty good, you know, all Moses said and Aaron. Maybe we should go back to that and not do this, this uh, Messiah stuff. So he says here in verse 12, for by this time you have to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, you have come to need milk and not solid food. So what is it that's happening? They are losing ground. They're going backwards. They're not growing because they're not teaching. Matthew 28, 20, <clears throat> teach all nations everything I have taught you. Every Christian is to teach, though every Christian is not called to be a teacher. I mean in the whole, whole assembly of, of, of God's people. Because we must teach or we shall forget what we know if we do not teach. 
And there's this um, small poem I got from a, 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 a book by G.H. Uh, Lang on this part of Hebrews. And it's a, by a gentleman named Trench. But here's, here's a brief poem. Ceasing to give, we cease to have, for such is the law of love. When we cease to give, we cease to have. And so the thing about the milk and the solid food is if you actually like stopped eating, if you only wanted to drink solids, your digestive system would partially shut down. I mean, your literal diet, I wouldn't completely shut down if you're 20 or something, but it would be weakened. And then, and, and then if you only had fluids and milk and stuff like that. When he says, and so when they stopped teaching, they actually went backwards to becoming an infant. Who were, they just wanted the elementary things, the milk, and they became unskilled in, in the word of righteousness. But verse 14 says, solid food belongs to those who are of full age. So solid food is appropriate to those who are healthy. And so he, here's the thing about not having a good diet. This is what happens to really sick people. They can, take in, they can be hurt and not know it. They can take in poison and not be aware of what's happening to them. That is, their body is so breaking down, they don't understand the pain of what's coming upon them. And so this is God's truthful evaluation. Listen, believers, you've actually slowed down, and I wanted to tell you about who Christ is after the order of Melchizedek. I want to explain to you his greatness as God's high priest, and how Christ as really prophet, priest, and king is going to be the mediator of all of you Hebrews becoming fully grown mature sons in the image of God. And as fully grown mature sons, you will inherit the kingdom of God. You yourself will be priests in the thousand year kingdom. You yourself will be mediators between God the Father and the nations of the earth in a coming age. There's all these things to say about this, but he couldn't say it. He just had to stop. Verses one, one through three, moving forward. So he says here, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles. The, the elementary principles of the Christ, what are they? They are repentance from dead works, faith to God. That's one pair. That's justification, the beginning of the Christian life. Doctrines of baptism are, are like washings. Not, not that you get baptized ten times as a Christian. You get one baptism, right? There's just one. One water baptism. But, but it has to do with the advance of, of, of the Christian life being to be washed. And it says the doctrine or teachings about it. They weren't necessarily saying, you know, wash your hands 20 times a day before you eat your food. They're not saying that. They're teaching about it. So they're talking about cleansing and they're talking about power for service, which is laying on hands. Power for service. And then so the third thing is uh, resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. That has to do with the end the end of things. So you got beginning, middle, and end. You got two pairs. You got a pair, a pair, a pair. And, and so that's the foundation of the Christian life. But you got to ask, you got to know, Christianity has a, has a foundation, but the foundation is not Christianity. It's only the foundation of it. Christianity is the whole structure. The house is not the foundation. The foundation is the foundation, mm -hmm. but the rest of the house is the house. The walls and in everything about a house, that's the house. So you have, this is what the devil wants to do to us as Christians. He, he has two things. This is a strategy towards believers. He either wants to keep you away from the foundation. He doesn't want you to be saved, right? Don't, don't come to the foundation at all. Stay away from it. Or if you do get saved, he wants to keep you satisfied with the foundation. The devil wants to keep you stuck on the foundation. He wants to make you stay there so you never grow. That's his, that's his game plan with us. And there's other things to say about that. But the Lord said, um, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. The, the Christian family, the Christian individual, the Christian the Christian community in the context of Matthew 5, 14, it's there, we're a city, sit on a hill. We're not like just the foundation of the city, you know, like little concrete slabs on a place. No, the whole thing's built, right? The whole city's built and it's light. So it's full maturity that is the perfect witness to the Son of God. Full maturity, a full house, a full structure. And so that's what we're invited to. Now, 4 through 8 says this. There could be a failure. That is, you could go off. The word he uses here in see, Hebrews 6, 4, if they fall away. 
What does the word fall away mean? It has to do from to uh, 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 leave the side of something. Like you're at someone's side and then you drop. Like you're next to them, then you, you drop away. It's possible to fall away from the place of growth and maturity and loving God's people and caring for the saints. He says, and he says here, for it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted that, the heavenly gift. So why is it impossible? You know, so I, I'm just going to give some thoughts and then I'm going to stop. There's some questions because there's a lot to say. But we have to ask, who are we as people? We're not machines. We are not robots. We are not something you put a coin in and it kind of operates. We're people. We're created in the image and likeness of God. We have God's image and likeness in us. Remember Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. you got to know who we are to understand what he's talking about. We are not angels. We are not the animal kingdom. We are not the vegetable kingdom. We are not the mineral kingdom. We are in the image and likeness of God. There's no one else like us in the universe. It's incredible what God made when he made men and women. It's amazing. But what is so amazing about our creation is that we have a choice as to what will become. To, to be in the image of likeness of God means that you're free like God is free. God is free. We are free. How are we free? We're not free to become God in our own strength. I don't mean that. But we are free to choose as he chooses. Because God wants men and women who will love him. Who will really love him. He doesn't want little toy soldiers that talk to him if you like wind it up, you know, and just kind of talks. He wants you to really love him. And you can only really love him if you have the choice not to love him. If you can choose not to love him, then you'll choose to love him. That's when you can choose to love him. So you have to be given the capacity to fail. God doesn't doom anyone to fail. But, but what is it, I think, does it kind of get to it? Why is it that some people who were once enlightened, and, and I believe he's talking about real believers, because if you're enlightened, it has to do with having knowledge, having understanding. If you taste of the heavenly gift, that has to do with like, and this is a parallel to Israel's history up to Kadesh Barnea. That's, that's what he's talking about. Remember, uh, Hebrews is, is using the history of Israel to warn us. You know, today if you'll hear his voice, not in heart, harden not your hearts. He's referring to Israel's rejection at Kadesh Barnea. That's what he's talking about as a historical parallel to this type of stuff. Because what he's saying is these, these uh, 600,000 soldiers, these, these men who were age 20 and uh, older, they, they had all these privileges. They, they tasted the heavenly gift. That is, they had the manna. They became partakers of the Holy Spirit. They had the bread. Remember when Moses struck the rock and, and, and the water comes out? And so they had water. They had bread. They had water. They had the good word of God. That is, they had the teaching and they knew it was good. They had the good word of God, and they had the powers of the age to come. The Red Sea was opened. The pillar and the cloud was there. All this stuff was working on their behalf. They had it all, you might say. And they knew they had it all, by the way. They knew it. But yet, they fell away. Mm -hmm. so, so here's the thing I just want to say candidly. There's something about us that only God knows person by person. But it is possible... Now, again, I think this is a very small number of people it's talking about. It's a very extreme example here. It's not the common thing. This is not the common thing. It's a very uncommon thing. But it's possible to repeatedly refuse God's grace, to repeatedly rebel, to repeatedly say no, to repeatedly continue in sin. I don't mean once or twice. I mean as a lifestyle. And so somewhere, someone crosses the line where God sees... They're not stopping. That person's not stopping. They're going to go on in what they're doing. Why? Because they have a free will. It's not like you push a button and you reset the software. This is a person. This has made the image and likes of God. So, what's left? Punishment. But what is the punishment? The, punish the punishment is not everlasting and eternal. It is not that. Now, the loss of privileges are but not the standing of being God's child. Verse 6, If they fall away to renew them again to repentance, that they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put into open shame. Verse 7, For the earth which drinks in the rain that comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessing from God. 
So the earth is compared to like God's people and even individuals, right? The ground, the, the uh, literal ground. And remember 1 Corinthians 3, you are God's building, you are God's field. So we're compared to like ground in uh, this type of thing. So the rain is the word of God, the love of the saints, encouragement, all these things are coming upon you, right? But if, if you bring forth fruit, yes, God will bless you. But what if you bring forth thorns and briars? Have you ever tried to grab a thorn bush? It hurts. And so it's, it is rejected and near to being cursed. Now it doesn't say it was cursed. It's near. So here's the type. The 600,000 men all died in the wilderness. Numbers 14, verse 33. Your carcasses shall die in the wilderness. They did not go back to Egypt. They did not run back down the peninsula, cross the Red Sea again, go back to Pharaoh. Hey, Pharaoh, put me back here. I'm back, you know. No, they didn't die in Egypt. They died in the wilderness. They died a people free from Egypt, but they fell short of Canaan. That's what he's talking about. They fell short. And so they were neither being, they were not cursed, but they were kind of close. Don't even get, don't do that, right? It's like, why are you testing God so much? Now, why aren't they cursed? Because God respects the blood of his son. The blood of Christ cleanses you. The blood of Christ advocates for Amen. us. That blood is so valuable. God honors the blood of his son shed at Calvary. Amen. So because of his blood, we are safe forever. The blood, Amen. the blood is the deliverance from Egypt. Remember, you had to put it on the doorpost. The, the angel came through and you weren't struck down. The blood is forever speaking for us. Amen. Praise God for that, the blood. The blood will not fail. But there's other things. They, they were going to go from Egypt to the Red Sea, maybe spend a year in the wilderness, and then take the land. But instead, they're 40 years in the land, and they all die. But then the next generation comes in and takes the land. So you see the types? The types. They lose Canaan. They don't lose the fact they're Israelites. But they lose Canaan. So that's the thing. So what does it look like for a Christian to have this type of punishment? It might be that you die young. 1 Corinthians 11. Some, uh, verse 28 through 30, some Christians were to partake in the Lord's Supper and they died. God killed them. Because when they came to that feast in Corinth, they were piggish, they were proud, they despised the poor. The Lord said, you're going to die. And they died. That's a punishment. That's, that's losing out. The other type of punishment might be missing out on the privileges in the thousand-year kingdom of reigning with Christ for a thousand years. That's a real privilege. Revelation 20, 4 through 6. And, they and these are priests of God, and they reign with him a thousand years. That is stellar. Mm -hmm. Oh, man, Lord, work in me. Pound away at me. So I'm worthy of that. You know, me, I'm saying to me, right? I need it. And, and by the way, it's happening. It happened yesterday. It happened before. God's working in me and my character. Mm -hmm. Things are coming up my family. God's showing me I'm falling short, and I'm repenting. I'm repenting. So I'm worthy of the coming kingdom. And so the point is, will your character match the glorious kingdom? Our character has to match. It would be immoral for God to give um, blessings and rewards if you're an immoral person. If you're an immoral person, God cannot morally and righteously give you blessings and rewards and privileges in his kingdom. You are in his kingdom, though. You're in it. You're in it. For sure. But you don't have what you could have had. And then um, 9 through 12 talks about uh, future expectation. And he says here in verse 8, Whose end is to be burned. Burning does not mean the lake of fire. It does not mean that. Burning has to do with temporary judgments. Now let's say if you had a patch of land, right? And it was all like, like messed up. It would do the farmer good to burn that land. Because in burning the land, all the weeds are killed, all the thorns are killed, and even to the roots, you kill the stuff, right? But the land is still there. So after the land is burned, you give it a rest, and then you start over. For some, it may have to be that. All the bad habits on, in America, God has to burn out of you. <laughs> hey, let's just repent now, okay? Let me repent right now. Lord, forgive me for my covetous. Forgive me for loving money. Forget no, all this stuff. Just do it now, okay? Amen. Don't let the fire get you. Just right now, just repent tonight. And, you'll, and God will get a new work in your soul now. So, burning, 
Because judgment will bring us to righteousness one day. Every single child of God will enter into his kingdom ready, one way or another. One way or another. May it not be the hard road. May it be the, the way of the cross, not the way of burning. May it be the way of the cross we come to his kingdom. So let's go with, uh, for, for the qu- questions. Hebrews 5.11. So I hope you get the gist of that. I'm just going to pause for a minute and then hit the stuff at the end. But it's a view of scripture. Because when you know the whole Bible, you can see it. If you just obsess on five verses, you could get tripped up, right? Four, five, six, seven, eight. But the whole Bible explains it. We need the whole Word of God to understand the Word of God. First question. From Hebrews 5.11, can a believer become dull of hearing? What does it look like for a Christian to be dull of hearing? And how can a Christian avoid that condition? They definitely can fall away from it and become dull of hearing where they once were, you know, well into God's Word, but then they now went back and said, we need to reteach you the basics. You need milk rather than meat. The original use of that phrase, dull of hearing, is back in Matthew 13, verse 15. And he says, for these people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Thus at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. It gives the uh, impression, first off, of being saved. So it's talking here both about people being saved and then also being brought back to God, those have been sent away from. And from there, he immediately goes into teaching the disciples a parable, um, the parable of the sower, where he says, When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart, that is he which receives seed by the wayside. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and am with joy receiveth it. Yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while, for when tribulation or peace or where persecution arises because of the word, by and by he is offended. Uh, in other words, he receives it, he is initially saved, but then when persecution comes, he falls back into sin, or he's drawn back into the things that previously uh, uh, restrained him because of sin. So God here is showing if you want to continue to grow, if you want to continue to stay in the word, well, you have to hear the word, be able to understand it, and then act upon that and bring forth fruit. We can only do that for abiding in him. And the way we abide in God is by reading his word, by studying the Bible to see what is well as for our life, what he wants us to be doing. It says in um, verse 14, uh, Hebrews 6, uh, 5 verse 14, but salt <laughs> is, is for the mature who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good, good and evil. What practice do you think he's talking about here in the room? What's the practice? So if you have people who are teachers, what are you practicing when you have the word of God? If you have different maturity levels and you're talking to people, right? What are you practicing? Discerning. You're discerning. You're discerning what? Where where they're at in their maturity. You're discerning where they're at in their maturity. That's what you're doing when you're practicing. You're discerning where God's people are at. You're discerning the good things and you're discerning the evil things. But you're also discerning the blessings too. You, You kind of discern it, right? But you have to practice it. Which means you have to get to know God's people, spend time with them, and talk to them. You have to talk to them, right? You have to discern. A good pastor, elder, teacher, or teachers, they'll talk at their congregation. They'll talk at them. But a good pastor, that's, that's a bad one. A good, pa- a good pastor, elder, teacher, our husband, our father, will get to know the family really well. They'll know the family first. They'll discern where the family is. They'll care for the family. They'll love the family. Family of God, their own family, you know. And in discerning, you can bring forth the right thing. You know, you share, you teach, right? That's how you become an effective, godly brother or sister. You're just sharing. It's not that you're public and you have a microphone in front of a thousand people. You don't need that. You do need the Holy Spirit in you, loving the saints with the Word of God. That's the equipment. Spirit of God in you, Word of God, people of God. It's just a really awesome thing. Question two. Is a Christian after their new birth automatically skillful in the word of righteousness? And to develop this skill, what can we say to people who are A, ignorant, misguided, B, encouraged and growing, or C, hardened their hearts and disobey? Okay, so no, it's not automatic to be skillful in the word of righteousness. You have to cultivate your understanding of the scripture and cultivate discernment of people and know where they're at. But those who are skilled in the word of righteousness meet people where they're at so that the word for the ignorant is a lamp, for the misguided it's a straight edge, for the those who are encouraged and growing it's a map, the word is a map, 
For those uh, who are hardened in heart and disobedient, the word of God is a loud sounding alarm. So the ignorant are those who don't know any better, and we need to direct them to the light in the word. So the light stimulates their senses to understand their purpose and give value, definition, and meaning to everything. It's the Holy Spirit's job to teach, and our job with the ignorant is to help them to study the scriptures through discipleship or by inviting them to Bible studies. The misguided are people who think they know, but they really don't know. We give them the word as a straight edge to show them where their lives don't line up with scriptures. The word defines what straight is so that anything that departs from that straightness, even just slightly, is crooked. So for the misguided, teach them to unlearn what they've learned and let the word of God straighten out their thinking. Teach them to ask, what does the word say about this choice or this behavior? And then for the encouraged and growing, those who are on their way to the heavenly city, but can be distracted or fall away. And so we need to be there to help them not to be distracted or turn away. We need to give them the map of the heavenly city, the scriptures, and then show them how to reach that end that they're um, reaching. Teach them not to stray from the map or else they will get lost. Or um, they might end up on the wide path that leads to destruction. So teach them not to allow hindrances such as theological dogmatism, idolatry of money, people or things, cultural ideologies, political parties, and coldness of heart, which would diminish the light to the heavenly city. And then lastly, the hardened heart the hardened in heart and the disobedient are those who need the word as a loud sounding alarm that moves them to repentance. Tell them the consequences of disobedience. We won't know how to reach them if we have a naive idea about God the judge. We have to take the warning of scripture seriously for our, our lives first before we can be that alarm for others. Yes, so there's different ways to bring the word of righteousness to people. Not everyone has the same need. There's different needs. Different people have different needs in different places. Question three, we kind of talked about the foundation. So I'd say for question three, <coughs> Hebrews 3, verse 6, but Christ has a son over his own house, whose house we are. If we hold fast to confidence and the rejoicing of the hope, firm and firm to the end, he is building his house through his faithful sons and daughters who are holding the confidence. They hold the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope. And so there is a fullness of life that comes when you're a thoughtful Christian and you're full of joy. You're full of joy. You're not Mr. and Mrs. Pessimistic. You're full of the joy of the Lord, which is your strength, because the confidence, it's not confidence in you. Fourth question, Hebrews 6, 4 through 8, and the whole book of Hebrews have strong warnings. How can reading such strong warnings help our attitudes, behavior, and treatment of others? Warnings are meant to uh, work in our attitudes and uh, change us. Number five, thinking of Hebrews 6, 9, the things that come with salvation, what are some blessings, privileges in the Christian life that accompany salvation? I was just thinking of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. As we grow in spiritual discernment, when we become a Christian, that's some of the uh, things that God uh, gracious bestows on us. Okay, thank you. Uh, sanctification, for, um, in verse 10 14, it says he, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. And, and then also is that he will bring us to the city which has foundation, and that sanctification will bring us to that city. And then I think there's a long list in chapter 12 of some of the things that they will come to. I, that's kind of what I was thinking. You know that list from Hebrews 12, from verse um, 22, you have come to Mount Zion, city of the living God, heavenly Jerusalem, the numeral couple of angels. All these things, they do accompany salvation. There's salvation, then what comes with it? See the two, two thoughts? The warnings in Hebrews 6 are about the things that accompany salvation. It's not about salvation itself. It's about what accompanies it. Questions 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5. Did anyone in the room have another comment on these five questions? For me, it's hard for me just to accept 
there's no eternal consequences in a person that would fall away. There's places you can get after you're saved, you could get so far away or fail from God that you could lose your salvation. And I know that's heresy amongst Calvinists, but Paul is constantly warning through all his writings. Uh, Jesus was warning all, and he's giving these illustrations about a person that builds on the sand or builds on the rock or about the sheep and the goats. Because there is so many deep warnings, I just think it would behoove us to look and study it that more. Thank you, brother. And, you know, I do agree. There are consequences. They just don't involve the loss of being God's child. But everything else, there's all these other things. Because when my kids were born, they're not born to be a child. They're born to be an adult and enter into maturity and privileges. But it's possible to go backwards and stay immature and lose those privileges. Now, here's something maybe to make it clearer. Scripture pounds a drum over and over again on the warnings. What is it warning about? 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Paul is not running to be born again. He's not running to earn the blood of Christ. Uh, you know, Father, put the blood of Christ me. I'm going to run, 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 run. And come on now, I've run a lot. You know, put the blood of Christ on me. He says, verse 25, and everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They do it then to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. There is an imperishable crown which can be given to any believer on the planet. But you have to run in such a way, verse 26, is not without aim. I box in such a way as not feeding the air. I buffet my body and make it my slave. Lest possibly after I preach to others, I myself should be disqualified. You can absolutely be disqualified from a prize because that's the purpose of a contest. It's to win a prize. That's the large, large idea. And the Jews, when they were under Roman occupation, they're yearning for a kingdom. They're yearning for the kingdom of David. That kingdom's coming. But if you want to, you might say reign, you better like... Be worthy of it. <laughs> you better be worthy of it. You're not just going to be some adulterer or some uh, swindler or whatever. You're not going to get in that kingdom. It's kind of like that. The privilege versus um, being a child. It's it's it privileges and rewards and enjoyment, and they're so great and incredible that they last forever. You could lose something that lasts forever, but you aren't lost. But you could lose something that is so incredible. And the reason why we have such a hard time understanding is in churches throughout America and the West, this isn't taught. It's just not taught that much. So when it's not taught, people don't know. And so people get used to a certain like bank of knowledge, but the, but the bank account's low. It's a low bank account. But God's bank account of knowledge is really high. I mean, he has so much he wants to give us. But if you don't know it, then you won't live for it. So it's like being illuminated about privileges and uh, position and status. There's many levels to it. It's awesome. I have a similar question about the same thing, about the verse uh, 6, where it talks about the crucifying the Son of God all over again. So one, so my question here is like the person who falls away or, uh, or who rejects, like once after he's saved and if he rejects the Christ, so is it possible for him to come back? Uh, is it like a temporary thing? But yeah, so the thing about crucifying them to themselves the Son of God, what it is is by their shameful behavior, by the shameful, disobedient, persistent rebellion, I mean, that's why Christ died on the cross, for rebellious, wicked race. And so if you're reliving that again, and you're a Christian, you're putting his name to shame. You're putting him to shame. That you are shaming the name of the Son of God. Because that behavior for which he crucified was crucified for, you're reliving. So if you're doing that, bad news. God will not pass over that. He will, and I'm, I'm talking about a persistent behavior. I'm not talking about a one-off or, you know, you might fail and you repent. I'm talking about a, a determined course where you're determined in it. Not that it's just a mistake or something. So that's, and so yes, it, it is possible to uh, lose the privileges of the kingdom, but still be in the kingdom somehow. You will be in the kingdom. If it says it's impossible, if they've done all these 
different things to bring them back to repentance. I have a, a problem thinking that they're going to slide in. The impossible has to do with this life. In right. this life, it's impossible. That's what he's saying. In mm-hmm. this life. Now, remember, there's more going on than this life. This life is not the whole enchilada. This life is a little slice of time in a timeline that's everlasting. There's other things God is doing, Scripture talks about. But in this life, yeah, you you can reach that, that point. Yes, in this life. That's why we need the whole Word of God. If this is all we had about the future, like let's say you had nothing else, right, the future, I'd say, oh, yeah, we got a problem here. But there's some, God is doing other things. See, not every verse tells you everything. It's like, it's not everything is in every verse. You have to read Revelation. Luke 16 talks about Abraham's bosom and then the other guy being punished. There's all these things, there's realms. So God's very active with his disobedient kids. He's very active with them. And he knows how to deal with them outside of our eyes. And he will. We just don't see it. But in this life, it, it could happen, you know, small, small probability, small number of people, but it could. It's the love of Christ for God's people that you'll find the truth. Because the Holy Spirit's not confused. By the way, he's not confused at all. Holy Spirit knows exactly what he's doing. But we are confused. I mean, the larger, I'm not saying you like person. I'm just saying the larger, you know, the larger body. So here's the thing. I remember at the Huntington Library seeing these uh, bonsai, bonsai, real small things. Like eight inches, right? Part of the Huntington Library. And what kept them small was being in a really small box. It's beautiful, but it was small. But if you actually planted the tree in like open ground, it would be huge. So this is the thing that happens to Christians. They get in a small box, real tight, and their roots don't grow. They're tight. They, they have a theological structure that binds them. The land they grow in is the Bible. This is where you'll become a hundred foot tall oak tree. This thing. This is the land. The theology is going to bind you. I like theology, by the way. I study it. I, like, I love talking about stuff. But a man's interpretation of it versus the Holy Spirit, it's two different things. It's a small bonsai tree versus the whole land, and you can be a really tall tree. Just to make it clear, you teach that a Christian cannot lose their salvation, but a Christian also has free will to deny the truth yes. and deny God and turn away from God. And it says that if we deny him, he also will deny us. That denying is the denying of privilege. Yes, that's exactly what I think the scripture teaches, that we have a free will. We can deny our Lord. We have the free will to deny him. We're not machines. We are real people in the image and likes of God. You could choose the wrong choice. Uh, however, if you walk with the Lord, you won't because the spirit will fill you and you'll be so full of love and, you know, you'll, you'll mature and you'll just be so full of love of Jesus. You'll, you're, you're locked in, but it doesn't mean you lose your free will. It just means you're, you're more like him and, and, and you're more with them, but you cannot lose the gift of salvation given to you. It is a gift. It's not a gift on a string. It's a gift. It is so awesome. It's mind blowing. Why God would be so good to us. It is mind blowing. Uh, Let's go ahead and close in prayer.